Okay, let's get started. Welcome everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. This is the Benefits of Nature-Based Solutions Playbook webinar, a part of our Resilience Playbook webinar series. Before I get started and introduce our speakers, uh, I wanted to briefly mention that this webinar is being recorded and links on how to find it will be available on our chat. It's usually available on our YouTube channel a couple of days after the event. Like I mentioned, let us know where you're joining from in the chat today. My name is Berna Idris. I am Greenbelt Alliance's Resilience Manager, and I am joining from Ohlone Land, also known as Oakland, California. And if you want to know a little bit more about which indigenous Indigenous land you are joining from, you can check out the link in the chat at nativeland.ca to find out where you're joining from. And I'm very excited to mention that at the end of this webinar, we are going to be announcing the winners of our Power of Nature Youth Art Contest. This was an art contest we designed to raise awareness uh, for nature-based solutions in our high school communities in the Bay Area. It's open to all Bay Area high schoolers, and we're giving away some amazing prizes like REI gift cards and na national parks passes. So I'm really excited to be uh, presenting that at the end of this presentation. And today we're joined with some incredible speakers. We have Josh Brad, who's a water spe watershed specialist and project manage manager at San Francisco Estuary Partnership, and Veronica Pearson, who is the senior ecological restoration planner at Marin County Park. So I want to thank them for joining. And before we go into a little bit of our chat with our speakers today on implementing nature-based solutions and learning more about their work, I wanted to tell you a little bit more about us here at Greenbelt Alliance. Uh, so Greenbelt Alliance is a nonprofit organization based in the Bay Area, and our mission is to educate, advocate, and collaborate to make sure that the Bay Area's lands and communities are more resilient to a changing climate. We really want to support a Bay Area of healthy, thriving, and resilient communities that are made up of lands and people that are safe during climate disasters and recover quickly from wildfire, floods, and drought. We envision a place where everyone can live in tandem with nature in new and powerful ways to come for generations. This understanding of our resilience is partially influenced by our legacy of advocating for the protection of the Bay Area's lands and people during our 60 year history. We know that with the appropriate policies like the ones we highlight in our latest tool, the Resilience Playbook, the Bay Area can address our environmental challenges and protect our unique ecosystems while also supporting our most vulnerable communities against the fight of the climate crisis. So before we dive into a deeper discussion, I know that nature-based solutions is a buzzword that is, you know, very popular with practitioners now and thrown around a lot, as well as being mentioned as a key climate solution in the latest IPCC report. And I wanted to illuminate a little bit about what nature-based solutions are. So the difference between traditional conservation and nature-based solutions is that conservation seeks to protect uh, biological diversity like plant and animal species, habitats and ecosystems by acquiring lands and participating in restoration projects and implementing laws. And nature-based solutions do all of this and more. There are pro projects included in nature-based solutions that talk about resource management, disaster planning, and green infrastructure, for example. And these projects have benefits to people and ecosystems. Many of them reduce our greenhouse gas emissions, lower the heat in our cities and communities, provide us with water or food security, or create clean air. And these are all examples of nature-based solutions. And a very um, good illustration of this that I love to use is if people are very surprised to learn that a community garden can be a nature-based solution, because there's certain plants in the community garden that can absorb uh, excess water, Community gardens provide trees that allow us to reduce temperatures, and they can be a way for people to have access to healthy fruits and vegetables. And so the compilation of all of these things together is what creates a nature-based solution. And our speakers are going to give us different examples of the nature-based solutions they're working on uh, in a little bit. 
So for us at Greenbelt Alliance, we really care about nature-based solutions because they are very important climate solutions. So these are some of the areas that Greenbelt Alliance focuses on. This is an original illustration done by our uh, community member, Alfred Twu. We envisioned this as what our future community should look like and something that we deeply care about in Greenbelt Alliance. We really want to support projects that help us sequester carbon and lower our emissions. We care about urban greening and urban parks to lower urban uh, heat island effects and make sure that we're not having high heat in our communities. We focus on research on green belts, greenways, parks, and other green spaces that can act as buffers during wildfire events. And we actually have released recently a Greenbelt wildfire white paper that covers this topic. So I encourage you to check that out. There'll be a link to that paper in the chat. We also look at wetlands and riparian ecosystems that can be solutions to absorb floodwaters, low, lower coaster, coastal surface temperatures, and protect our communities against sea level rise. And we know that all of these different projects really make our communities' health more resilient, both physically and mentally. So these are just some of the solutions that we highlight in our resilience playbook and care to advocate for. Uh, and before I invite our speakers to chime in here, I wanna give you a brief overview of some of the challenges and opportunities of nature-based solutions and why we care about doing this work. As you probably know, historically, access to green spaces has really been limited to more affluent and white neighborhoods in our communities, and that's due in large part to our planning decisions. There are countless studies shown from across the country where the highest childhood asthma rates are in places that usually lack access to nature. Uh, and that's why we really advocate for a transformational approach to nature-based solutions. So we not only protect our communities against exacerbating existing inequalities, in our physical environment and in our social systems. We also care about remediating historic harms done to communities in the first place. And it's part of the reason why we advocate for this work. And to briefly give you an illustration, I want to provide some statistics that show just how important it is to talk about access. According to a recent report done by the Hispanic Access Foundation, 55% of Latino communities in California lack access to open space compared to 36% of white residents. The World Health Organization recently released a study that says that it is recommended that an urban residents have access to at least uh, uh, two acres of open parkland within a thousand feet of their home to protect their health. And in order to do this work, we really have to talk about meaningful engagement. What types of communities can get involved in, in the process of nature-based solutions? What do we have to do as practitioners and planners and community advocates to make sure that we have diverse representation on these projects? And how do we teach communities about the benefits of nature-based solutions and why we're doing the work and how people can get meaningfully involved in this work? And part of that really comes with thinking about how we use the resources we already have one of the things Greenbelt Alliance is really committed to focusing on uh, in our upcoming research is how to incorporate traditional ecological knowledge, uh, also known by other names, including indigenous knowledge or native science. This refers to the evolving knowledge acquired by indigenous and local peoples over thousands of years of their local history. Uh, after being in direct contact with the environment. This knowledge is usually specific to locations and includes the relationship between plants, animals, and natural phenomena and the timing of events that impact people's life ways. And we really know that working in tandem with nature is also having a conversation about building authentic partnerships with the native peoples of California that are the original stewards of this land. And it's really good to see initiatives like 30 by 30 working to embed traditional ecological knowledge in conservation projects. And this is becoming more and more of a concert, uh, a conversation in uh, nature-based solution spaces. So we today would like to invite you to learn more about how to get engaged in diverse nature-based solutions projects. 
And to highlight one last statistic before I invite our speakers to have a conversation with me, why this work is imperative. This is a map by the California Department of Parks and Recreations. It's called the Park Access Tool. It was created in 2020. And this map shows how many communities uh, across California, but this is a zoom in to where we are, lack park access. And it, it turns out 21% of residents of, in California live further than half a mile from a park, from walking distance. And that's about 9 million people in California. That is not a small number. After learning so much about the benefits of being around nature, living near nature, and letting nature do its job, we really have to think about how we further the access conversation and educate our communities about nature-based solutions. So with that, I encourage you, if you have a chance after this webinar, to check out our Resilience Playbook. This is a tool we created that has strategies for planners to engage in equitable uh, city planning through public engagement methods highlighted in our Centering People and Equity First chapter. We also have a chapter written in partnership with our uh, partner organization, Save the Bay, on harnessing the power of nature, which talks about how to embed nature-based solutions solutions in planning, like general plans, et cetera. And now I'm super excited to introduce to you our speakers for today. We have Josh Brad. He's a watershed specialist and project manager at the San Francisco Estuary Partnership. He specializes in green stormwater infrastructure and watershed management issues. He also oversees the Bay Area Watershed Network for the partnership. And before joining the partnership, Josh spearheaded the creation of a citywide watershed management plan for the city of Berkeley. He's also been the executive Executive Director and Restoration Director of the nonprofit Urban Creeks Council. He's also worked as a watershed specialist for the Contra Costa Countywide Clean Water Program. Josh holds a bachelor's degree in political science from the University of North Carolina. Thank you so much, Josh, for being here. We also have Veronica Pearson with Marin County Parks, who is a hydrologist and leads the agency's sea level rise projects at Bolinas Lagoon, Bovine Marsh, and McInnes Marsh in Marin. She's worked for over 15 years on wetland restoration and land use planning. She has a Bachelor's of Science in Forestry and Natural Resources Management from Cal Poly San Luis Obispo and a Master's Degree in Geography from UC Davis. So thank you so much both for joining me today. So before we jump into the nitty gritty details, I would love to know a little bit more if you could tell the audience about your positions and the nature-based solutions projects that you've worked on or are currently working on in the Bay Area, just to give a little more context about your work. Well, I'll, I'll jump in. I am a project manager for the San Francisco Estuary Partnership, which is a collaborative entity that works with all levels of government nonprofits, science, academia, community groups to partner on innovative projects and programs that protect and restore habitats and water quality in and around the Bay. My role had been mostly tied to green stormwater infrastructure, um, which is a nature-based solution that uses landscaped facilities like rain gardens uh, to capture and treat uh, polluted stormwater runoff. Uh, we just completed a multi-city, multi-site project on San Pablo Avenue in the East Bay called the San Pablo Spine, um, where we did four retrofits um, on this major thoroughfare and, and are treating about six acres of urban runoff uh, with these facilities. Uh, now I'm migrating more into sh the shoreline version of nature-based solutions, which is focused on the concept of horizontal or living levees. Uh, these are embankments or slopes that are designed with a shallow outslope to allow for the creation of transitional habitat for plants and animal species that are losing their existing habitats to sea level rise. Uh, the Estuary Partnership staff assists the Coastal Conservancy's management of the San Francisco Bay Restoration Authority, which is a, 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 a funding source for shoreline uh, wetland restoration planning and implementation projects. And in this capacity, I work closely with the North Richmond Horizontal Levy Working Group, which is helping to guide a planning and design effort at two scales. Uh, one scale is limited to the West County Wastewater District's treatment plant. And the other scale is looking at a uh, living levy that's uh, much 
longer, looking much further past uh, those property lines and across many property lines, envisioning a larger levee alignment that would offer uh, more habitat uh, creation opportunities, more flood protection for the, the vulnerable communities uh, that are behind that, and public access where the levee can incorporate segments of the Bay Trail. Um, and I'm also the grant manager for another shoreline effort to increase channel capacity, habitat, and public health or public access, sorry, at the mouth of Colma Creek in South San Francisco. And I'll stop there. <laughs> uh, clearly, Josh keeps himself busy. <laughs> Veronica? Hi, everyone. Um, yes, so I, I lead Marin County Parks planning efforts um, for the agency's priority sea level rise adaptation projects and represent the aging agency in a number of the regional discussions related to near and short term planning for sea level rise and climate change. <clears throat> the agency's priority projects are the Evolving Shorelines Project at Bothy Marsh Open Space Preserve, which is between Mill Valley and Sausalito, uh, the Bolinas Lagoon Y Wetlands Project, which is at the north end of Bolinas Lagoon, and the McGinnis Marsh Restoration Project in San Rafael, and with the China Camp State Park. And these, these three projects are on lands that are owned and managed by Marin County, Park, Marin County Parks and uh, the Marin County Parks, or Marin County Open Space District. Uh, they're all at different stages of design development and include multiple benefits that include wetland enhancement and restoration and infrastructure improvements that may include um, trails, uh, public access roads, and, and include nature-based strategies as well to address sea level rise and loss of wetlands and public access. Um, the nature-based solutions that are being proposed for the projects vary. The Bolinas White um, project really the primary strategy uh, of adapting to flooding from sea level rising climate changes retreat. So we're proposing removing roads from predicted flood inundation areas, restoring hydrologic and geomorphic processes um, by uh, returning Lewis Gulch Creek onto its alluvial fan and floodplain, which it is now disconnected from. Um, and, and both in Marsh, uh, the evolving shoreline project is looking at um, retreat as well by relocating the Bay Trail to the far Western edge of the preserve um, and also incorporating uh, strategies such as living levees or ecotone levees, um, of which the trail can be located on um, as well as um, including other features, habitat features such as um, marsh mounds and um, uh, creating uh, coarse aggregate beaches to protect from shoreline erosion. Wow, those sound like some awesome yet very complicated projects. And, you know, as with your experience being practitioners of this work, and I'm sure at some point talking to planning departments and other departments uh, within these uh, municipalities, do you have any insights or recommendations about how to, you know, talk about your projects to policymakers or figure out a way to integrate these nature-based solutions projects in larger planning efforts, or if we have any insights on some challenges doing that cross-departmentally wherever you're located. Yeah, I could just jump in and start off. Um, in particular, right now, Marin County is updating um, their general plan. We call it the countywide plan. And um, this is an opportunity for policies to be included into the document, which is used you know, to, um, to review projects that are being proposed and influences the development code as well. Um, and uh, so currently right now, Marin, um, Marin County is not only doing update to um, the hazard sections of the county wide plan, but also to the housing sections. And um, this is, this is like probably one of the best opportunities to look at both of those things together, which you know, nature-based strategies require space. And, um, and that is in particular in Marin County, we're very limited um, in that 80% of our land is tied up in either open space parks um, or working in agricultural lands. Um, so um, it's, you know, this is probably the time to, that we can have the greatest influence, but it is also the time where 
um, you know, for in order for policies to get made, it requires um, um, it requires the public also being in support of these policies to um, get them, you know, in the plan and get the support from um, our, our support supervisors. So um, the challenges in, you know, in doing so is being able to get um, the public to see the benefit of um, nature-based solutions when they can affect multiple landowners and can mean major changes in land use and um, in how development can happen. So um, I think the general plan is a great place to make policy changes, but it is also one that really requires uh, the support of the community. Yeah, that is something that we are intimately aware of here at Greenbelt Alliance, because we do a lot of advocacy to empower people to go to those general plan meetings and give input about these types of projects. So I can definitely relate. Um, Josh, do you have any takeaways? I guess I would say that, you know, the way I see it, I think the, the San Francisco Bay is mostly in a planning for planning type stage when it comes to climate resilient adaptation, especially with uh, with nature-based solutions. And it's critical, um, like Veronica said, that policymakers be more vocal about the threats and vulnerabilities posed by sea level rise to make this a societal priority. Um, we need more resources, funding, public agency staff time, technical support to better center impacted communities, especially frontline communities and adaptation planning processes that will identify and meet community needs. Um, another challenge is there's not really a widely accepted common framework for what should be included in adaptation type plans. They can vary in form and content. Um, I think that there's progress being made on the federal and state levels in terms of targeting funds towards uh, climate resilience and disadvantaged communities. Um, but you know, bond measures and infrastructure grant funds are often limited to or must include implementation. And it seems like really what we need the resources for right now is the community-centered planning, technical expertise and design and engineering, um, a pathway to regulatory approvals for this this kind of novel approach to actually, you know, what is now looking at, you know, looking at and like filling the bay or some elements of it to get some elevation to, to fight um, sea level rise. Um, Long-term funding for operations and maintenance <laughs> and um, plans for governance for projects that are uh, public and private partnerships that are, you know, going beyond just private pr public lands and into private lands. So I think those are a lot of the major challenges in front of us that jumping towards uh, funding shovel ready projects is kind of skipping some steps. Yeah, definitely. We certainly feel the same way. And I wanna narrow in on something that you both mentioned, which is a lot of this work is done through capacity building and educating the public on nature-based solutions and you know, really teaching the importance of why this needs to happen in order to gather broader support. I'd love to dive into that a little bit more um, to hear from you and your experience, whether you have experience with this or you know, ideas around this issue, how, how would you teach the public about nature-based solutions and get them involved in both the design and maintenance of these restoration projects if you have any examples or in an ideal world, if we didn't have governance issues, what could that possibly look like? Um, I, I think I'll start off on this one too. Uh, and really probably just point to our evolving shorelines project at Bothy and Marsh because um, it's probably some of the work that I've done that I'm the most proud to be part of. Um, and uh, it, it has been a long process. It's taking a long time to do the outreach work that we've done, but um, I think we're seeing the fruits of our labor. But it really, I mean, it really started with parks needing to understand what, um, how both the marsh even evolved. So we, our first step was just understanding the evolution of the, the marsh and, and its um, history. Um, and then, um, also seeing the uh, 
to the wetlands um, with sea level rise, um, as well as uh, you know what it means for the Bay Trail and what the Bay Trail's impacts uh, are on on the wetlands themselves um, and the public use um, of uh, both the marsh open space preserve. Um, so we spent a year um, really doing the historical dive into it and um, had scientific yeah, some scientific experts help us um, draft documents that we then um, used to start our educational campaign. And, and we really started it off with bringing in um, a large group of stakeholders that we knew would be very interested in what we were doing with the Bay Trail and the wetlands themselves and, and included. Um, not only regulatory agencies, but in local landowners, um, uh, but it also included like the Marin, uh, Marin Co County Bicycle Coalition um, and then the Marin Conservation League. So you know, environmental groups, recreational groups um, as well. Um, and just getting and sharing the information with them. So they, they just had that knowledge of like, what, what has happened in this place? and what will happen if we take no action. And um, it, it's evident because at Booking, we're already seeing the effects of sea level rise with a king tide event. Um, you go out there on the Bay Trail and, and many people have even seen these pictures in the Chronicle where it's completely inundated. The whole wetlands is submerged. And that is an indication of what we're going to see in the very near future. And it is dramatic to see all your, you know, the wetlands potentially drowning. So. I think by sharing that information, we got a lot of um, we we got a lot of the stakeholders to to realize that they had a strong vested interest in being part of developing a vision for this place. So they were our first step in the, in in drafting loosely what we wanted as a vision and hearing from them together, like all of these people together in workshops about what our vision statement should be, um, and then going out to the over a year, we did uh, events just to share out the report and get input on the vision and find out what people valued. And um, we really wanted to make sure that we heard from a diverse group of people, not just the people that always participate in our um, in in our meetings. And um, that meant getting the families that to working professionals who don't have time for these kind of things. And the way we saw it was, we just got to make it fun. And uh, we were strong, we're lucky to have a strong partnership with the Golden Gate National Parks Conservancy, who is all about fun. We're parks, so we like having fun and doing stuff. So we put together a number of events, kayaking on King Tides. Um, we did a lecture with Mill Valley Library and had a fluvial geomorphologist show all of her historical maps and photos that laid out evolution visually of the, the marsh. Um, and then we did um, scavenger hunts with kids. Um, and that was a great way to get parents, right? Um, as well as educating the kids and a bike ride with MCBC held at like one of the local um, uh, coffee shops, Equator Coffee, uh, you know, hosted us, um, farmers events, brew fest, like we just spent a year talking to people and, um, and doing these things through next door, which like many people just had from and joined just because they got that, that message that there was a kayaking event and it was free. And, um, and they wanted to have, you know, it sounded like fun. So I think that really paid off because once we got to the part like of surveying people saying, you know, this is what we hear, is it right? We had like over, you know, close to a thousand people participating in some of our surveys and more than that, giving us feedback over the, you know, the, the evolution of these concepts. Um, and, um, and they still, um, are participating as we're reaching out and developing conceptual designs on the 30% um, entering into the 30% designs for, for the project itself. But I, I will say that COVID and having virtual events kind of put a damper on it. So we're looking forward to doing more, more educational outreach you know, in our parks with people in the near future. 
Yeah, that sounds awesome. And some really good examples for any practitioners on the call who are wondering about how to make planning meetings uh, more exciting and public outreach more exciting. I would love to be asked to kayak the bay to right. give public feedback instead of going to a city council meeting or another meeting. So that sounds awesome. Uh, Josh? Yeah, I guess I would um, kind of mimic a lot of what Veronica said is uh, for the North Richmond Shoreline Project, uh, we began a public engagement process uh, in partnership with a local nonprofit um, as our primary community liaison. They're called the Watershed Project. Um, they went to community events to discuss sea level rise um, and to speak with North Richmond community members who are an extremely low income uh, community of color. Uh, it's a black community shifting towards Latinx, um, trying to understand how these residents currently use the shoreline, uh, what they'd recommend to make the shoreline more inviting, uh, other community priorities that are currently unmet. Uh, we met with community leaders, uh, the county supervisor, city and county staff, residents. Um, we had field trips um, also. Um, and, and, you know, we're tabling at uh, public events that, that crowds were coming to, trying to go to where the community already is, and using the information that, that we gleaned from these interviews, uh, coupled with technical recommendations from the San Francisco Estuary Institute, which is one of our science partners who did the historical ecology of that area, uh, we were able to develop a, a, a vision also that recommends restoration and conservation strategies and priority projects that are um, that are tied to those community needs in some way. You know, the strategies were were developed to make sure that they didn't just let uh, these ideas fall away. Um, this was back in 2016, I believe, and this was like a year long project. The following year, the Resilient by Design contest uh, came. Uh, it focused on North Richmond and used that vision document as really the basis and starting point for uh, more community engagement and uh, the concept design development. They created a, uh, that they had a multidisciplinary team that created um, graphics and a report for moving forward. And then the next year after that contest was over, we took those resources and had a small grant and we began um, focused stakeholder meetings uh, and engagement to advance those recommendations around the horizontal levy and um, this is still an ongoing work group. It has representatives from yeah, the county, different divisions and, and departments within the county, uh, the city of Richmond, East Bay Regional Park District, the Wastewater District, uh, Republic Refuse Services, because there's a landfill that operates right there, or at least a transfer station, as well as uh, other property owners and local nonprofits and individuals, um, you know, the, the Bay Trail planning folks also. And from these meetings, uh, the West County Wastewater District, who was hosting these meetings, they submitted and received a grant from the Restoration Authority to develop those 30% designs for the horizontal levy on the treatment facility and then looking at that broader, that broader expanse. Um, and I think the, the takeaway is that with the fragmented ownership and uses of, of shoreline parcels that this work takes time to get folks aligned with a common understanding and a strategy adaptation and, and, and putting that work in early is super important before you even start putting pen to paper really you know um, what what is it that are the values of the community and what are their needs yeah absolutely and uh you know there's a question here in the q a box that i think is really relevant as a follow-up question and mm. it says how do we make sure that nature-based solutions don't reinforce traditional power resource allocations and instead promote equity more specifically do you have any insights on how we can involve stakeholders and I know you both started you know to answer that with different examples but one of the things that was mentioned earlier is the fact that funding pathways are always for shovel ready projects and folks are really putting in a lot of energy to say like give me a project that I can fund. And it's like in the implementation stage, but what's really missing is that focus on like educating people, making sure that there's diverse resources to include people, right? In conversations and having uh, grants that are related to capacity building. So in that vein and in the, you know, the vein of this question that was asked, I, if, I would really like to know like, 
again, like in an ideal world, if, you know, we had all the funding opportunities, what would, what would some of these like resources look like? Like what should we advocate for as Greenbelt Alliance to our, you know, regional and state uh, offices when they ask us feedback about like, what type of grants do you want to see or what type of funding is necessary if you have any insights? Yeah, it's imperative to meet the community where they are rather than expect them to come to us or to you or to some kind of process that, you know, they, they may or may not see the value in, um, you know, on the front end. Um, it, you know, you need to provide participation stipends. I think that's really important, especially with very low income communities, food for meetings, child care for meetings, um, other compensation for their time. You know, they are experts at at their community um, and you're asking for their expertise and their input and they ought to be compensated for that time. Um, and it's often a non-reimbursable expense from these grant funding programs. So I would be advocating for that discretionary type of funding that can be used for this type of planning to make sure that folks can be in the room or you can go to them. Um, the goal is to understand community needs and priorities, find that approach that includes them uh, in, in, in setting project planning objectives. Um, and I think that using trains, local community members to supplement maintenance is an ideal outcome on projects like this to, to create some economic pathways or career pathways, um, but that needs funding sources as well. Um, so does operations and maintenance period. You know, that's, that's also a conundrum and a, and a reason why public agencies sometimes forego or walk away from a project saying that they don't have that in their budget to, to really steward a project once it's built. Um, involving traditionally excluded stakeholder and community members is critical to avoiding those inequitable outcomes that you're talking about, the continuation of the legacy of exclusionary institutional processes. Um, a common refrain that we hear is, is increasing cultural competency of public agency staff so that they can better engage uh, disadvantaged communities and indigenous groups and, and communities of color to be able to speak that language rather than being high up in the, in the jargon and feel like you know, we're experts coming to them rather, rather than it being a mutual relationship. Um, I'll say that this summer, our organization is gonna be releasing a regional needs assessment report of disadvantaged communities and tribal partners that were part of a um, a grant where uh, needs assessments were undertaken in various communities. I think it was in 15 communities around the Bay. And um, lessons learned from that and um, feedback provided from these outreach partners who are frontline community uh, EJ advocates um, or, or uh, nonprofit groups, you know, had a lot to say. And so we're distilling these messages and they'll be available sometime this summer. We're still working out the, the publication of it, but I think that's gonna be um, a really important tool. Um, and just, um, just understand that it also working with disadvantaged communities, it can be a rocky road because these folks have been traditionally excluded in the past and, um, they're understandably distrustful of institutions that have left them out and have often proved not to have their best interests at heart. Yeah, I think Josh said it well. Um, and in particular, I just would say that like having individuals that they do trust or, or working through an organization that they do trust to be leading that meetings, the meetings to engage with them is probably the key to getting good attendance and getting people to participate. Um, and so, yeah, especially for government, you know, like uh, it's, yeah, it's one of the ways, reasons why I think our Bothian Marsh project is really successful is because a lot of our outreach came, um, was promoted and, and led by the Parks Conservancy. Um, and, and I think that helped us reach a, a wider audience. Um, and I think also having people at, you know, having, um, having those who not only, you know, can, um, are there to, are interested in nature-based solutions because it's part of their project or project they're pursuing, but also, um, uh, you know, the leaders of the community that can, um, 
help ad, not just advance advance all interests of the parties that have come, you know, to, to the groups that come. So it, it's not, um, you know, would obviously, if it's about nature-based solutions, you know, you want to hear about what they think about um, implementing them on lands that may uh, impact them, but also what other things that concerns them from implementing nature-based solutions? Is it housing? Is it, is it, you know, their health, you know, services, then having group, you know, uh, directors, assistant directors, management from those different agencies present as well as important. Yeah, and uh, it looks like there's a question here in the chat that I want to pose and just want to let uh, our audience here know that I'm going to be going on to the audience portion of this conversation. So if you have any burning questions for our speakers, please put them in the Q&A portion or in the chat and I can ask uh, our speakers, there's a question here. Someone asked, how can we speed it up? And I think they were talking about the process of these projects. How can we speed the process up because we don't have much time in terms of climate change? And is there any way to, you know, and I'll add my bit to that, do community engagement, but also have timelines where we can really address the risks that are happening rapidly? Uh, it's a great question. Yeah, that's a great question. I, I, I think that there is, um, you know, just the, the reality is that this stuff does take time. And un, I do understand that the reality is we don't have a lot of time, you know, so those two things are certainly in tension with each other. Um, however, you know, I think it's important to be as stepwise as possible so that we don't, you know, basically have unintended consequences or do something, you know, really off on the wrong foot. And also, I would say that, you know, what, what I think we really need are some models in the ground that can be, you know, you know, templates for projects to come after them. Um, also, you know, and templates for how this public engagement and, and community centering can, can occur. Um, you know, so we have a lot of separate projects going on. You know, I think it's important to learn from each other. For this region to you know try to become more aligned in this effort so that there can be a more streamlined approach to this but it, we're not there yet we're just not there and i and i appreciate that question um because you know i i think about it also yeah there's a cost that comes with cutting corners and um i think we don't want to do that when it comes to the community involvement process but um I, it would be nice if we could speed up the regulatory process because that is one of the biggest hurdles that we have is the amount of time it gets to get a project just through permitting. Yeah, it's always a challenge to make sure we have enough time to do good work, but also uh, cut through the green tape, like I like to call it. <laughs> um, there's another question here on the chat about what can our viewers do currently um, on a day-to-day -day basis to get involved in this work, if you have any tips. Well, I say reach out to your local politicians and let yeah. them know they're not doing enough, they're not saying enough, or we need more and we need this now. Um, I think that's probably the number one thing. Um, yeah, for me, that's the number one thing is, is light a fire underneath folks. Cause I think as a, again, as a society, we're not talking about it enough. You know, I have a friend who's working in schools because, you know, the climate change isn't really taught in schools a lot. And there's been kind of a, uh, you know, there's been a cone of silence around that, um, in some schools and some school districts. And, um, you know, he's working at kind of trying to dismantle that. So, you know, the more we can be upfront and transparent about these, uh, about this, you know, slow coming but inevitable crisis, you know, the better we'll be, because um, right now we're still just kicking the can down the road. Yeah, I would definitely say the same. Call your representatives, your board of supervisors, let them know that this is something you want them to prioritize. And that, you know, partially answers another question that we have here in the chat that says, 
So much of this relates to being uncomfortable with uncertainty. We've done so much research, but we'll never know with 100% certainty what the right answers will be. How can we get funders, local governments, and community members to be more comfortable with these promising yet uncertain nature-based solution strategies? big meaty question. It's hard to plan for uncertainty. How do we get the public comfortable with it? I, yeah, I don't know that the public's not comfortable with it. I just think that there's just not enough of these conversations happening. Um, that's in my opinion. Um, and the, un the uncertainty to me is, is more around, um, you know, will these efforts get permitted or not? Like that's the uncertainty. It's not, um, you know, would this be an effective tool? We understand that embankments, you know, we've been using some type of uh, embankment technology for thousands of years as humans uh, to protect the things that, that we want to protect. Um, and we're looking at a way of rearranging that in a way that is protective of the things behind these levees, but also using the levee itself as, as a resource. Um, and I don't think there's distrust, but there is not a avenue, a clear avenue towards implementation. Um, I, and, it, and it does actually get hung up on the regulatory community um, right now, whether there, there is no clear pathway to get these projects permitted to make them go in the ground. So that might be another thing to work on. Yeah. <laughs> There's so many different avenues to address this. I'll ask my final question and then I'll move on to our exciting announcement of our Youth Art Contest winners. The last question here is, can you comment on if and how you integrate citizen science into your planning? I don't think I have a comment on that. Um, I, yeah, I don't, I don't, I cannot respond to that one. Um, or the nature-based solutions element. Yeah, I, I, I well, I think we have. Um, I mean, we've used citizen science at our preserves. Um, we've the Parks Conservancy has actually done a number of bio blitzes um, on our lands. Uh, so that's one great way to for us to actually you know get species lists and accounts of um, of wildlife and vegetation communities. Um, and I think we'll continue to, you know, try to do those. And, um, if the pro, you know, any of our projects ever do get constructed too, uh, we, we plan to use citizens to help us, uh, collect data and do, do, do some monitoring. And that could be, um, a good answer to folks who asked how to get involved. Stay tuned in the future. You might be able to gather your own data and provide it to, uh, parks departments if projects uh, you know, get to the implementation plan, which hopefully they will. Uh, I just wanna thank you so much for this conversation. This was so interesting for me as a practitioner who works, works to educate many different people around nature-based solutions. And I wanna thank you for your time and for the projects that you're working on. They're so important and we've gleaned so much from this conversation. Uh, so thank you again. And thanks to all of you who are tuning in and listening to our conversation. I am going to share my screen now to get to the exciting announcement of our Youth Art Contest winners. All right, thank you. Okay, so you should be able to see my screen now. Let me know. I think we're, uh, hopefully you're seeing the Power of Nature presentation. Okay, sorry, let me just make sure I'm, okay, cool, yes. Yes, there's a, there's a virtual drum roll here. Thank you so much. So uh, I'm very excited to announce the winners of our contest. First place goes to Up by Naomi Chien. And uh, this is a digital piece that we were extremely impressed with. Here is the description of the artwork on the screen. And I asked all of the uh, artists a question about how they think young people can learn more about climate change and get involved. And Naomi's answer was, because climate change is something that will become a part of every single young person's life in the future. 
I believe there's a place for everyone to do something. I also believe that the climate problem is not a scientific problem, but a social and political one. My recommendation is to start with small steps in reaching out and connecting to local representative politicians or the public, whether it be through mediums like art or writing, voice is your greatest power. Just remember to keep persisting because change is sometimes very challenging. And I think she said it really well, especially after the things we talked about today about political will and getting involved. So congratulations, Naomi, on this amazing piece. Second place, we have Below the Surface by Kayam. And when I asked him the same question about young people getting, getting involved, he said, social media. There are tons of resources out there for anyone curious about climate change. As for getting involved, just shoot any organization or person an email. People are a lot nicer and more welcoming than you may think. And he also said, shameless plug, baycs.org. And this art contest is in partnership with the Bay Area Youth Climate Summit. And Kain is actually a member of the Bay Area Youth Climate Summit. And we've worked with them in partnership to do advocacy trainings for young people, to teach them how to give public comment at city council meetings and general plan updates about issues just like this, about talking uh, to their elected officials regarding supporting nature-based solutions projects and other, uh, other issues that imp impact planning and climate change. So if you are a young person on this call and you wanna learn a little bit more how to get involved, you can check out our website under get involved or check out baycs.org, that's B-A-Y-C-S.org. And last but not least, our third place goes to Sophia, Sophia who made the uh, replenish our forests artwork. And when I asked her the question about how young people can get involved, she said, I think that right now social media is a big thing for my generation in parentheses, fortunately and unfortunately. So I feel like growing a strong online presence would help spread knowledge to a wider audience. I also think that another way people can get involved is through their communities. Personally, I know of a few climate clubs in my area that I could join in order to learn more about our environment and support the cause. So I wanna congratulate all our winners again, and hopefully you are inspired by the takeaways that these young people had on how to get involved. And I'm hoping that all of you will end, you know, after this presentation today, feel motivated to write a letter to your city council members or attend a local city council meeting. Greenbelt Alliance actually has a toolkit on how to give public comment or write a letter to your uh, city council about these issues that uh, we can share with you in the chat if you're interested. And finally, to wrap up our uh, webinar, I'd like to tell you a little bit more about what to expect here at Greenbelt Alliance. This webinar is a series uh, in our Resilience Playbook webinars. We are going to have future uh, series uh, focusing on uh, wildfire risks and other wildfire research, as well as other issue areas to find out more events that you can get involved in both virtually or in person. Check out our Eventbrite page. Another thing that we hope to continue doing with our Resilience Playbook tool, like I mentioned, is work on advocacy campaigns across the Bay Area and empower people to get involved in local city and county planning processes. So if you ever are interested in hosting a presentation in your community to learn how you can become a local community advocate, feel free to email me. My email is on the screen and I'm happy to talk about facilitating an event like that. Along with, we want timely updates to our Resilience Playbook tool. We know that science is constantly you know, you know, improving and there are a lot more research and case studies coming out, and out on how to uh, do these projects with best practices. So we hope to have timely content updates on resilienceplaybook.org. And finally, I'd like to leave you with um, plugging our next big event, which is our Hidden Heroes project. Hidden Heroes is our annual gala fundraiser where we highlight uh, hidden uh, workers in our city and uh, counties, like in planning staff or city staff that really do amazing behind the scenes work, like some of our speakers here today that usually don't get to be the front facing folks on projects that get the recognition for the amazing climate work that they're doing in our communities. So we're currently looking for nominations. If you know of any city or county staff, that are doing amazing work that you would like to highlight and honor, check out our Hidden Heroes nominations on our website and we'll put a link in the chat. 
And finally, thank you so much for being here. This work really is not possible without you and your support. If you enjoy these events and supporting our advocacy, please consider donating via the link in chat. It has been an absolute pleasure, Josh and Veronica. Thank you so much. I have learned so much that I hope to incorporate in some of my presentations. And with that, I'd like to wrap up if there isn't uh, anything else.